good evening to you all uh, it's my pleasure to uh, invite uh, or introduce uh, dr punsiri gunatilaka uh, the today speaker he's my batchmate uh, and uh, one of the brilliant uh, undergraduate character and he's a young gynecologist in the country even though he's bald headed he's young that is the bald headed because of hyperandrogenism okay let me introduce uh, punsiri uh, gunatilaka uh he will be talking today uh, on obstetric hemorrhage uh, and he will be covering antepartum hemorrhage and postpartum hemorrhage uh in depth uh, the things that you should know as an undergraduate okay punsri over to you yeah can you see, uh, see me no you are uh, video yeah, is Pundari. off punsri uh ah. we can't see you but uh, your screen has been shared right yeah now we can see you thank you uh, very much uh, dr gihan for your uh, kind uh, introduction and uh, one of my uh, uh, best uh, discussion mate uh, when i was uh, in the faculty and uh, i would like to uh, uh say thank you very much for the organizing committee of pemsa for inviting me uh, uh for this lecture and uh, when i was an undergraduate uh, we we thoroughly uh, i mean enjoyed uh, and uh, gain a lot from these uh, lectures and uh, uh, i will uh, i am wishing you uh, all very best uh, to the uh, organizing committee uh, for uh, continuing this uh, good work uh, right okay uh, let's uh, talk about obstetric hemorrhages which is uh, which is a very common uh, right which is very common in the uh, field of obstetrics and uh, this includes both uh, antepartum hemorrhage as well as postpartum hemorrhage so what i'm going to do today in this lecture is i will basically go through the courses for this antepartum hemorrhages and the courses for the postpartum hemorrhage and uh, how we are dealing with uh, uh, such occasion and uh, the uh, the outcomes the investigations and all the stuff right so uh, as i told you the obstetric hemorrhage includes both the antepartum hemorrhage as well as the postpartum hemorrhage it is it is one of the major cause of maternal deaths uh, in uh, globally as well as in sri lanka so roughly about 2050 uh, 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 250000 maternal deaths globally occur per annum and uh, this uh, obstetric obstetric uh, hemorrhages is uh, uh, the leading cause of maternal deaths in uh, 2016 in in our country right uh, so let's uh, initially talk about the antepartum hemorrhage so uh, the antepartum hemorrhage is bleeding from or into the genital tract occurring uh, uh, from 24 uh, weeks uh, of pregnancy and prior to birth of the baby so uh, this complicates about 3 to 5 pregnancies and uh, it is one of the uh, main cause of perinatal and uh, uh, maternal uh, mortality uh, mortality and this causes about 20% of preterm babies uh, born in association with this uh, antepartum hemorrhage uh, so this includes uh, bleeding from uh, placental abruption uh, bleeding from uh, placenta previa and bleeding from local causes such as uh, uh, vulval growths vaginal cancers cervical cancers so the local causes and the uh, vasa previa that is bleeding from the fetal vessels and in uh, some of the cases we may not be able to find a cause so we, uh, so those are categorized under unexplained antepartum hemorrhages right uh, so when it comes to this bleeding assessing the severity of blood loss Uh, is the main part of managing so uh, usually the amount of blood loss is underestimated so the patient may come and tell you that uh, uh, doctor i lost uh, a cup of blood and uh, sometimes they may come and say i lost a bucket of blood so it's very very uh, difficult to analyze uh, uh, by the history or even at looking at it so it's all i mean almost always underestimated and uh, for an example uh, we'll talk about this concealed placental abruptions uh, uh, in my uh, next slides uh, 
So in concealed placental absorptions, there may be a lot of blood inside collected within the uterine cavity, uh, which is not evident at all. So uh, we may be misleading by the amount of blood. And uh, so therefore, it is very vital to uh, look for the signs of clinical shock uh, when it comes to uh, uh, antiparticle hemorrhage. So, uh, uh, so you need to check for the, the pulse, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and all these vital parameters and see whether the mother is going into a shock. And uh, the presence of fetal compromise, demise, or, or the demise is an important indicator of uh, uh, the, the blood loss. Right, uh, so this is a rough grading of the antipartum hemorrhages. Uh, so it starts from spotting, that is a small amount of staining, streaking, uh, or blood spotting in the undergarment or sentry pads. And uh, the minor hemorrhage is the, uh, the blood uh, loss less than 50 ml, which is already settled. And uh, the major hemorrhage is the, uh, uh, when the, blood, uh, the amount of blood loss uh, is uh, between 50 to 1000 milliliters, that is uh, up to one liter, without uh, the evidence of clinical shock. Massive hemorrhage is a blood loss greater than one liter with uh, signs of uh, clinical shock. And uh, there's another entity called recurrent antipartum hemorrhages where there are more than uh, one episode of uh, antipartum uh, hemorrhage bleeding. So this is basically actually this picture uh, goes with the postpartum hemorrhage, but I just included that uh, if a mother comes and say, uh, or the partner comes and say uh, she bled a lot and which is about uh, one meter, uh, 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 one meter into one meter size uh, uh, area. So that, that is roughly about so the patient has lost about 1.5, uh, uh, 1.5 liters. So rough and roughly idea. So if, the, if there's a blood on the bed, so roughly about uh, one liter. And when it comes, if the blood flows onto the, uh, the flow, so it's roughly about more than 1.5 liters, that is massive hemorrhage. Right, so let's talk about uh, placental abruption, one, uh, uh, one vital component of the antipartum hemorrhages. Uh, so the definition is the complete or partial uh, separation of a normal normally located placenta from its uterine site uh, before the delivery of the patient uh, of the fetus so what happens is the placenta separates so there will be bleeding coming uh, out from the, uh, uh, the through the uh, the uterus so the the patient may come and say uh, i'm having the severe abdominal pain with pv bleeding and uh, so sometimes uh, the uh, the mother may complain of reduced fetal movements right uh, so these are the, the, the types of placental separation. The, uh, the, the first, the first uh, one shows the partial separation. There's a uh, uh, small, uh, I mean, part of the placenta is separated, uh, which results in uh, bleeding uh, uh, PV. And uh, this is the marginal separation. We have the margin of the placenta separated, and then the small amount of bleeding, sometimes uh, significant bleeding comes uh, per vagina. And uh, this is the concealed hemorrhage, whereas the, uh, the placenta uh, separate completely, and uh, but the blood is not uh, pouring out, so it's concealed. But the, the mother may present with uh, severe abdominal pain, reduced fetal movement, sometimes even shock, evidence of shock. And this is the complete uh, separation of the placenta with heavy vaginal bleeding. Right, uh, so let's talk about the risk factors for placental abruption, which helps us to find the, uh, these type of cases. So if there's a history of a previous uh, uh, placental abruption. This is the most predictive of placental abruption. So if there's one uh, previous history of uh, uh, abruption, there's 4.4% of having abruption. And if there are two uh, previous uh, evidence of uh, abruption, there's, uh, 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 there's 19, uh, 19 to 25% uh, uh, percent, uh, uh, percent, uh, chance of uh, getting another abruption. And uh, when the mother is having preeclampsia, fetal growth uh, restriction, non-vertex presentation, polyhydramnios, advanced uh, maternal age, these are uh, some of the risk factors. Multiparity, low BMI, so a, lo a lot of uh, 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 in the list, and smoking, drug misuse, threatened miscarriage um, in the first trimester, and maternal thrombophilia, uh, factor V laden prothrombin gene mutation. Uh, those are weak associations with uh, placental abruption. Right, okay, uh, let's move on to the uh, the other uh, 
component of uh, antipartum hemorrhage that is bleeding from the placenta previa. So the placenta previa is uh, where the placenta lies directly over the internal loss. And uh, there's another entity called lower line placenta where the, placenta, the lower edge of the placenta is about uh, within the 20 millimeter range from the internal loss from a trans abdominal scan or a transvaginal scan uh, after 16 weeks of period of gestation. So the second picture shows a low line placenta and this one is a, a placenta previa. So if the placenta is low line uh, or placenta previa at routing anomaly scan, which we usually done in between 18 to 22 weeks. So uh, we should, uh, we usually perform a follow-up scan, transvaginal scan at 32 weeks to diagnose whether this placenta previa or low line placenta is pers persisting. And if the placenta previa is persisting or low line placenta is persisting at 32 weeks without any, I mean, afterwards, without any uh, bleeding or complications, we'll repeat another scan at 36 weeks to confirm the diagnosis of low line placenta or placenta previa and to decide on the mode of treatment. This is just a normal, I mean, normal theory stuff for you to, uh, uh, for you to inform. I mean, this, these facts are a bit important. Uh, in your uh, clinical cases. And uh, one uh, important thing is the cervical length. Uh, so if the cervical length in a placenta previa or low line placenta mother is less than 35 millimeter, that is 3.5 centimeter, there's increased chance to have a preterm cesarean section due to massive humorage. So we need to be more cautious on these type of patients. If we, I mean, if we happen to see a patient with a placenta previa, low line placenta with a short cervix. Right, so let's uh, move uh, through the risk factors for a placenta previa. Um, so uh, when there's a, a past history of previous placenta previa, there's increased chance to have, again, in the current pregnancy, previous cesarean sections, uh, previous termination of pregnancy, multiparity, advanced maternal age, multiple pregnancy, smoking, and the deficient endometrium due to presence of uterine scar endometritis, and uh, previous uh, suction curettage and something for fibroids. These are the risk factors to have a placenta previa. So, uh, I mean, it's always better to be prepared for these uh, antipartum hemorrhages uh, when you diagnose with this placenta previa. And uh, so if you diagnose a placenta previa and you need to give the steroids for the baby's lung maturity uh, in between 34 to 35 weeks and uh, Sometimes if the mother comes with antipartum hemorrhage episodes prior, then you need to give it uh, before 34 weeks. Right, and uh, so this is, uh, this is a placenta previa which is not complicated with bleeding. So if, uh, if the mother comes with antipartum hemorrhage uh, and uh, we need to uh, I mean, consider delivering between 34 to 36 plus 6 unless the bleeding is not much heavier. And uncomplicated placenta previa, we usually deliver in between 36 to 37 weeks. And we can drag on up to 38 weeks. Uh, and in such a case, we need to keep the patient in mode. Right. As the third thing, uh, third one is the bleeding from Vasa previa. So in Vasa previa, the fetal vessels run through the three placental membranes. Uh, so uh, these uh, placental, uh, I mean, these fetal uh, vessels are unprotected by placental tissue or the uh, Burton's jelly. So there are two types. One thing, uh, the type one and type two. Type two, the vessel is connected to a velamentous, uh, velamentous umbilical cord. So this one is the type one, which is my as A. And the, the type two is uh, where the, uh, uh, there are two, I mean, the, the accessory uh, placental tissue or succentuate lobe. And these uh, two lobes are connected with vessels and uh, the vessels run in the membrane near the, uh, the internal lobes. Right. So, uh, so these uh, vessels are, are high, high, there's high chance to rupture these vessels uh, when the mother is in active labor or at amniotomy. So these type of mothers are usually, I mean, they present uh, with uh, uh, antipartum hemorrhage, that is PV bleeding uh, during uh, antenatal period uh, when they uh, come with the issue of uh, 
tripling uh, or when they come with the history, I mean, uh, when you attempt to do the amniotomy uh, for induction of labor. So, vasopharyngeas can be diagnosed antenatally and uh, usually and sometimes at the anomaly scan, uh, but uh, there are insufficient ev evidence for universal screening. And if the diagnosis is confirmed as vasopharyngeas, you need to do elective section in between 34 to 36 before the, the mother goes into labor. And uh, ruptured vasopharyngeas is, uh, uh, I mean, it should end up with an emergency cesarean section and deliver the baby and the resuscitation because the bleeding is basically from the fetus. Right, so we have gone through the uh, common common causes for this antipartum hemorrhage and then uh, uh, can antipartum hemorrhage be predicted? So usually even though there are risk factors to have this uh, uh, the antipartum hemorrhage, it's a bit, I mean, uh, it's a bit uh, difficult to predict and 70% uh, of the antipartum hemorrhages occur in low risk pregnancies. And uh, is there any possibility of preventing antipartum hemorrhage and uh, limited evidence and uh, if uh, there are, I mean, uh, if you can change the modifiable risk factors such as smoking and drug use, uh, you can reduce the uh, antipartum hemorrhage. So why are we too much worrying about uh, uh, this antipartum hemorrhage? So there are complications, uh, uh, the maternal complications as well as fetal. So the maternal, com maternal com uh, complications are the anemia, uh, infection, maternal shock, uh, renal tubular necrosis, uh, consumptive uh, coagulopathy, and uh, postpartum hemorrhage, pro uh, prolonged hospital, so many complications. And when it comes to the fetal complications, fetal hypoxia, small for gestation age, and fetal birth restriction. And prematurity, which is hydrogenic or spontaneous, as well as uh, the fetal demise, that is fetal death, uh, one of the uh, uh, disastrous uh, fetal complication. Right, so let's talk about uh, management of a woman uh, with an antipartum hemorrhage, management of a mother with antipartum hemorrhage. So you should take a brief history and uh, if the patient is stable and assessment of the extent of vaginal bleeding. So we need to get an idea about the amount of bleeding and uh, assessment of cardiovascular status of mother and uh, the the mother is a priority once the mother is stabilized then we think about the baby and we'll assess the fetus and then uh, we'll assess the fetal baby so uh, each and every mother who presents with uh, even a spotting uh, minor uh, or major antipartum hemorrhage you need to be admitted to the hospital and uh, if the if the patient uh, is having heavy bleeding and uh, unstable you may need to deliver early or you may need to transfer the patient to a center with the facilities and uh, you need to immediately uh, do the clinical assessment uh, to establish whether there is an, any necessity of an urgent intervention uh, to uh, manage uh, the maternal or fetal compromise so if there's no uh, maternal compromise in an antipartum hemorrhage, if the mother comes with the uh, spotting or minor, minor hemorrhage, uh, then you can take a full history. So in the history, you should assess whether the mother is having a pain associated with this bleeding. So in abruptions, what happens is uh, uh, the blood, uh, uh, there's a significant amount of bleeding, uh, uh, pain, which is continuous and uh, the, uh, the uh, the mother may complain of uh, uterine contractions, continuous contractions, hardy abdomen with PV bleeding sometimes, and uh, and uh, you need to identify labor as well uh, if, if this intermittent uh, pain. Then uh, in the history, you should identify the risk factors for abruption and placenta previa, and uh, you should get an idea about the uh, fetal movements from the mother, and if the bleeding is associated with rupture membrane then you should consider vasa previa. And uh, uh, regarding the local causes, you can ask in the history about the cervical smear, whether she has undergone a cervical smear recently, but was it normal or uh, any, any vaginal cause beforehand. Right, uh, so examination of a mother with antipartum hemorrhage. So you should do a primary survey where you assess the airway breathing and circulation. And if the mother is in shock, and if the mother needs resuscitation, you need to start on resuscitation. So I'll discuss the resuscitation uh, under the uh, postpartum hemorrhage component. And uh, then you need to uh, sort out the causes for hemorrhage or the collapse. 
uh, on examination uh, abdominal palpation in abduction you will have a tender woody feel of the uterus and if the, the uterus is uh, soft and non-tender in antipartum hemorrhage most of the time it's a lower a lower genital tract uh, cause uh, or bleeding from placenta previa or vasa previa and speculum examination you need to do carefully and uh, before that you need to find out whether there's uh, you need to exclude placenta previa and uh, this will help to uh, find out local causes as well as uh, uh, cervical dilatation Digital vaginal examination should not perform until you do a ultrasound scan to exclude placenta previa. And uh, this provides an uh, information on the cervical dilatation if antibody hemorrhage is associated with pain or uterine fertility. Right. Uh, these are the investigations which you need to do. Uh, when a mother comes with uh, antipartum hemorrhage. So uh, I'll talk about the cannula and all the stuff when it comes to the uh, uh, postpartum hemorrhage. And uh, so you need to do a full count and then at the same time you need to send blood for post-matching at least four units depending on the amount of bleeding. And coagulation screen, blood urea, serum electrolyte, liver function to the baseline test. If the mother is an RH negative, uh, you need to do a Clyho test which is not available in our setup. This helps you to uh, the identify the amount of uh, uh, fetal maternal uh, uh, the crossing, uh, uh, the crossing, and uh, you need to do a, a ultrasound scan for black central location. And uh, the sensitivity of ultrasound scan to uh, detect abruption is very poor; it's around twenty four percent. But the po uh, the positive predictive value is very high. One. That means if you diagnose uh, abruption ultrasonically, the chance of having an abruption is very high. So you need to intervene. This is very important in, when it comes with these concealed abruptions. And uh, in terms of fetal investigations, you need to do an ultrasound scan for fetal heart and growth and representation and a CTG to see whether the uh, fetal heart rate is okay. Right, uh, so let's talk about the management. Uh, so, so there's a, a risk of preterm delivery uh, with the antipartum hemorrhage. So a single course of corticosteroids should be administered to the mother. Uh, so between 24 to 34 plus six weeks. And uh, tocolytics are generally contraindicated in abruption. What happens when you give tocolytics to an abruption is uh, the uterus become relaxed. So that will increase the, uh, the abruption amount of blood in between the placenta and the uterus. And uh, uh, so the tocolytics are contraindicated in major AP uh, antipartum hemorrhages. Uh, the blood loss is less than 1,000. And uh, with uh, hemorrhagic with unstable mother or fetal compromise. And it's relative contraindicated in mild uh, bleeding. So basically, I got uh, the tocolytics are contraindicated. And uh, let's uh, discuss about the labor and delivery of an antipartum hemorrhage. Uh, so antipartum hemorrhage with maternal or fetal compromise, you need to deliver immediately. So if a fetal, the fetus is compromised, then a cesarean section is an ideal and uh, you can uh, con uh, concurrent resuscitation of the mother. And uh, if the mother is stable and uh, the fetus ended up with end death, uh, we usually try to deliver the baby uh, through the channel. Uh, antipartum hemorrhages less than 37 weeks without maternal or fetal compromise and uh, when the bleeding has settled, there's no evidence to support of elective premature delivery. So you can wait till uh, 37 or whatever the duration. And uh, if the antipartum hemorrhage uh, occurs after 37 weeks without maternal or fetal compromise, so we need to ex uh, I mean establish whether this is an antipartum hemorrhage or this is blood stain show. And if the antipartum, I mean, if we if you are certain that this is antipartum hemorrhage, and if the antipartum hemorrhage is spotting or blood is streaked through the mucus, there's no need of any intervention. But minor, that is uh, up to uh, 50, uh, less than 50 milliliters of blood loss, and major up to 1,000, and beyond that, uh, you need to uh, induce the labor. Right, so uh, intrapartum monitoring, uh, for antipartum hemorrhages. Uh, so you need to do a continuous electronic field of monitoring for three terms, major APHs or recurrent minor APH and minor APH with the placental insufficiency that uh, when the baby is having fetal growth restriction or 
you can go ahead with intermittent auscultation uh, with uh, one episode of minor and departed hemorrhage and uh, without any subsequent concerns on maternal or fetal weight. Right, uh, mode of anesthesia, for uh, regional anesthesia is recommended for operative delivery unless there's specific contraindication. And when there's maternal or fetal compromise, general anesthesia, it will help to facilitate maternal resuscitation and expedite the delivery. So we usually request for general anesthesia. And uh, management of third stage of labor in antipartum hemorrhage is very important. So you should anticipate the postpartum hemorrhage. And uh, so uh, antipartum hemorrhage from placental abruption or placental previa, you need to do the active management of third stage. So this active management of third stage, it has three, uh, three main components. Uh, uh, first thing is uh, uh, giving a top, uh, uh, giving uh, eutrotonics, uh, oxytocin, uh, IEM or intravenous uh, at the, after the birth of the child and uh, uh, early cord clamping, then uh, the uh, control for traction. These are the three components of active management of third stage. And uh, you need to use ergometrine uh, to manage the third stage in placental abruption or previa in the absence of hypertension. And uh, regarding NTD for RH negative mothers with uh, antipartum hemorrhage, so you need to give NTD to all non-sensitized RH uh, negative mothers, uh, RHD negative mothers, independent of routine prophylaxis. So we usually give routine prophylaxis, sometimes single dose, sometimes double dose. Double dose, we give it on 28 and 34, and single uh, regime, single, single dose regime, we give 1,500 international units at 34 weeks. So irrespective of these uh, prophylactic doses, we need to give NTD. And if there's any recurrent, uh, a recurrent vaginal bleeding, antipartum hemorrhage after 20 weeks, you need to give NTD uh, six weekly uh, uh, onwards. And after 20 weeks of gestation, uh, you need to do a fly hot test actually to find out how much uh, fetal blood has uh, gone into maternal circulation by doing a fly hot bed kit test, which is not available uh, because this uh, 500 international units usually covers 4 ml. So if the, the blood uh, uh, cross matching is, I mean, the, the blood mix up is more than four milliliters, then you need to give more uh, entity that is a uh, robot. And uh, blood and blood product, products for antipartum hemorrhage, uh, when it comes to massive or major, uh, sometimes we may need to transfuse. We'll talk about uh, the, uh, the when to transfuse and uh, what to transfuse again uh, in the postpartum hemorrhage uh, segment. So uh, you should, uh, Go for the uh, packed red, red cells or whole blood. And uh, if the mother is in need, I mean, the, the blood is very urgent and you, uh, the mother has lost a huge amount of blood, you can go for now, uh, or negative blood or group specific. And uh, you need to manage the coagulopathy, uh, mainly in massive blood loss or major abruptions, which may result in DIC. So you, you uh, need to do urgent protein profiles, but till you get the protein profile, you can start on four units of FFP, 10 units cryo, uh, till you get the results uh, to uh, prevent the DAC, which we usually do. Right, so let's have a small chat about the management of neonate after an antipartum hemorrhage. So, I mean, uh, this massive antipartum hemorrhage, mainly the abruptions, was our previa and uh, delivering of a baby through anterior uh, placenta previa or anterior uh, low placenta, which may result in fetal anemia mm -hmm. and fetal compromise. So then we uh, need to uh, sometimes a pediatric team uh, transfuse uh, blood to the fetus, the baby. Uh, antipartum hemorrhage in extremely preterm pregnancy, uh, regardless of the baby, we need to uh, stabilize the mother as usual. And then uh, we need to, uh, uh, lies with the pediatric team and uh, uh, we usually try the conservative uh, management plan when the mother is uh, stable. Uh, so after the uh, delivery of an uh, antipartum, uh, 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 antipartum hemorrhage mother, uh, you need to think about the thromboprophylaxis. When the bleeding is settled, we start on uh, uh, the thromboprophylaxis and then uh, uh, pressure graded stockings, and we need to discuss with the mother about the antipartum hemorrhage, the events, and uh, the things which we do, and uh, we need to explain it to the uh, the partner as well, uh, and the incident reporting. Those are the uh, 
the things which you need to do in postmodern. So that is basically the uh, the components included in the antipartum hemorrhage. Uh, we'll uh, go to the uh, next component of my lecture, which is the, the postmodern hemorrhage. Uh, can you see my screen? Hello. Yes, sir. All right, right. Uh, so uh, let's uh, go through the postpartum hemorrhage. This is the second component of my uh, lecture. Uh, right. So the postpartum hemorrhage can be, that is the uh, bleeding after the delivery of the ba uh, baby. So it can be uh, divided into two, two main components, primary postpartum hemorrhage, as well as the uh, secondary postpartum hemorrhage. So the primary postpartum hemorrhage uh, is the loss of uh, 500 milliliters or more blood from the genital tract within 24 hours uh, of the birth of the baby. And the secondary uh, postpartum hemorrhage is abnormal or excessive bleeding. And there's no I mean, cut off the amount of uh, blood loss uh, from the birth canal between 24 hours and 12 weeks postnatally. So this can be uh, categorized further into minor and major. Minor means uh, more than 500 milliliters up to 1000 milliliters. Major means more than 1000. And uh, the major further divides into moderate and severe where the moderate is the blood loss uh, after delivery between 1000 to 2000 and severe means more than 2000. And in, in, when it comes to a cesarean section, we call it postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, the cutoff limit is more than 1000. And there's another entity called massive PPH where we take the cutoff as 1500, which is very important where we, we see the, uh, the uh, lowering of blood pressure and the components. So as the antipartum hemorrhage, PPH, postpartum hemorrhage remains a major cause of maternal mortality worldwide. Uh, right, uh, so let's talk about the causes and the risk factors and uh, this four T's, uh, I think, which, uh, which is uh, known by most, I mean, everyone. So the torn tissue, trauma, and the thrombin, the causes for bleeding. And uh, the, the, the most commonest cause is the uterine atony. And the risk factors are the multiple pregnancy, previous postpartum hemorrhage, preeclampsia, fetal macrosomia, failure to progress in second stage, prolonged third stage of labor, retained placenta, placenta creta, and uh, the uh, perineal laceration, general anesthesia. So uh, in uh, antenatal, when the mother is having anemia or previous issue of postpartum hemorrhage, uh, uh, so there's high chance so it's a risk factor to have a postpartum hemorrhage. And then the intrapartum causes are the retained placenta and prolonged labor and postpartum is that is retained products of conception and infection. So uh, it's very important to minimize the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. And what we can do during antenatal is correct the anemia. And uh, so uh, you do the full blood counts, uh, booking and uh, 28 weeks and the cutoff for the hemoglobin and the booking is 11 grams per deciliter and the cutoff for the hemoglobin at uh, 28 weeks is 10.5 so when the hemoglobin is low we start on high dose of fire elemental life right and then it is very important to identify the risk factors and deliver the mother in a tertiary center if there's any necessity for an example if the mother ended up with massive pph in the previous pregnancy having an anemia uh, and in current pregnancy, you'd better send the mother to a tertiary center to um, uh, with the 24-hour uh, uh, blood bank, 24-hour operating theaters are available. And uh, during, uh, I mean, you need to find out the intrapartum causes for this uh, postpartum hemorrhage. So you should anticipate the postpartum hemorrhage and backup methods ready with the backup, ready with the blood. And then you need to go ahead with the acute management of third stage 
uh, if there's any I mean, risk factors to have a, a, a postpartum hemorrhage. So uh, uh, as I told you early, what we do is uh, ipratonic uh, after delivery of the baby or anterior shoulder, a port clamping and control port traction are the three uh, components of the active management of the stage. And uh, so you can use eutrotronics to uh, minimize the risk of post postpartum hemorrhage. So you, uh, after vaginal births, we give uh, intramuscular oxytocin uh, 10 units or intravenous 5 units. And in, after cesarean section, we give 5 uh, units of uh, oxytocin. And you can use the ergometry uh, 0.25 or 0.5 milligrams IV or IM. And uh, if there are any contraindications such as uh, uh, preeclampsia or severe PIH, and uh, you can uh, use the oxytocin ergometry that is ergometry combination in uh, women with increased risk of bleeding and carbidocin. Carbidocin is an uh, analog of oxytocin, which has more, uh, more, I mean, uh, more powerful than oxytocin, uh, and uh, uh, and it's. Uh, it's uh, half life is more, and uh, you can use the misoprostol and carboprost as well. And uh, tranexamic acid, you can use the uh, tranexamic acid in the context of cesarean section uh, with uh, oxytocin as a slow IV injection, uh, but uh, you try and massage, and it's uh, not only prevention of uh, PPH, but once it comes with the PPH, it comes handy. Right, uh, management of uh, PPH. The principles, I mean, uh, so there are a few components uh, in the management of uh, postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, so you need to communicate with the medical staff, communication, uh, communicate with the, uh, the patient as well as partner and uh, the laboratories and the initial assessment and the resuscitation. And we'll discuss about the resuscitation targets as well. You need to start monitoring and do the investigations. And that's uh, you need to act to see uh, to reduce the bleeding. This is mechanical, medical, or surgical. So these components has to be done together, right? And uh, and post procedure care, the brief documentation and risk management, as I told you in the uh, previous uh, lecture on antipartum hemorrhage. So the communication, uh, communication. Uh, is mainly uh, with the ops team, the anesthesia, anesthetic team, and uh, the theater staff, the blood bank, laboratory, hematologist, and uh, most importantly, the patient and still less the family members. And uh, so let's talk about the management of uh, postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, first, I mean, the initial assessment and the resuscitation. This is very important. As I told you uh, in the previous lecture about the antipartum hemorrhage, the visual assessment of blood loss is mostly inaccurate and you need to correlate with the clinical signs. Uh, during pregnancy, the pulse blood pressure usually maintained within normal range until the blood loss uh, exceeds 1000 ml. So uh, up to 1000 milliliters, you won't see any change in the heart rate, respiratory rate or the blood pressure. Uh, there can be some tachycardia, tachypnea, and slight fall in the systolic blood pressure uh, when the blood loss is between 1000 to 1500. When it comes to a massive, massive uh, postpartum hemorrhage, that is when the blood loss is more than uh, 1500 milliliters, the systolic blood pressure will go down up to 80, and this will associate with worsening tachycardia, tachypnea, and altered mental state. So you need to act very fast. Uh, so this is uh, the pic uh, pictorial reference guide to, uh, I mean, uh, help to find out the amount of that loss. Uh, a soft sanitary towel usually contains about 100 ml, and as I told you earlier, uh, a 100 centimeter diameter flow spill, uh, that is one meter diameter flow, uh, flow spill, uh, usually the loss is around 1.5 liters. And that the, uh, if the blood is uh, spread on the bed, the amount, uh, the amount of loss is roughly about one liter. And if the blood has uh, spilled onto the floor, the loss is usually around two liters. So, so when the blood is uh, on the floor, it automatically goes into a massive postpartum hemorrhage. Right, let's talk about the, the resuscitation uh, in the minor PPH. So the minor PPH is the blood loss between 500 uh, milliliters to 1000 
uh, milliliters without clinical shock. So you need to pay, I mean, uh, uh, get the intravenous access. Usually we uh, use a white bow uh, cannula coating gauge. And then uh, at the time of uh, the, uh, the uh, vena puncture, we uh, take uh, a blood of 20 ml for group and screen, full blood count, coagulation screen, and increase uh, fibrinogen. Uh, pulse, respiratory rate, and blood pressure recording should be done every 15 minutes. And uh, we commence on warm uh, crystalloid infusion. Uh, can you excuse me for a minute because I'm getting a call from the ward. I'll come back uh, in a second, right? Hello, are you with me? Yes. Hello. Sir. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, I got a urgent call from the board. Uh, my on call uh, SHO was ringing. Right. Sorry about that. Right. Let's talk about the resuscitation. And uh, so, uh, uh, so that uh, the measures which we take for minor postpartum hemorrhages, that is the blood loss between 500 milliliters to 1000 without clinical shock. And uh, we, uh, as we said, we uh, get the intravenous access and uh, then blood will send for the investigations. And uh, we need to monitor the pulse, respiratory rate and blood pressure every 15 minutes. And uh, you need to uh, uh, start on uh, some crystalloid infusions uh, uh, as well. Right. So when it comes to a, a major postpartum hemorrhage, uh, you need to, uh, that is a blood loss more than 1000 milliliters. Uh, and uh, when there's continuing uh, bleeding or clinical shock, uh, we uh, do the primary survey, that is we assess the airway, breathing, and then the circulation. And uh, we put on two white book cannulas, uh, usually the, the orange ones or the white ones, sporting gauge ones. And then we take the blood for at post matching, full count, coagulation screen, fibrinogen, renal function, liver function for the baseline. And uh, we position the patient flat, keep the mother warm with a blanket, and we need to transfuse as soon as possible. Right? Until the blood is available, you can uh, infuse with the crystalloid, warm crystalloids. So up to two liters, and then you need to start on blood as soon as possible. So if the blood is getting delayed, you can go for these or negative bloods or groups receive bloods till the, uh, the uh, cross match bloods is available. And uh, uh, till then you, uh, you need to go ahead with the crystalloids. Right, so these are the resuscitation targets. So the hemoglobin should be kept uh, more than 80 grams per liter and the platelet count should be uh, uh, kept uh, more than 50 for thrombin time. Uh, less than 1.5 times normal and APTT less than 1.5 times normal and fibrinogen level uh, greater than 2 grams per deciliter. So till you uh, get this, uh, uh, the clotting profile, if the mother is uh, uh, continuing on bleeding, we need to give uh, the uh, the clotting factors, that is the FFT four units as well as cryo uh, till you get the, the results. Right, so uh, this type of mothers with uh, major postpartum hemorrhages, massive postpartum hemorrhages should be monitored in HDU or ICU, and their temperature should be monitored every 15 minutes, and continuous pulse blood pressure respiratory rate monitor should be monitored uh, using a, a cardiac monitor, and uh, the uh, fall catheter should, uh, I mean, uh, 
uh, which, which is already inserted, should use to monitor urine output. Initially, we usually monitor around hourly and uh, consider about an RTDL line with the uh, discussion with the uh, ICU staff and you need to escalate the management depending on the uh, uh, MIOS chart uh, scores and documentation. Right, so let's talk about the, the, the management of bleeding in a postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, initially, you need to check whether the uterus is contracted. So if it is contracted, it will be firm uh, to hard in the midline below umbilicus. And uh, we need to check for the, uh, we can ask uh, for the completion of the placenta and the membranes uh, from uh, the, uh, the people who are at the labor room uh, and uh, uh, people who did the delivery and then examine for general tract trauma. And at the same time, I mean, these things has to be done simultaneously with the help of a, 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 a team and uh, look for the, uh, the bleeding manifestation like, such as cannulocyte bleeding, usually a sign of uh, uh, DIC. Right. So, management of uterine atony, which is the commonest cause for this postpartum hemorrhage. So, uh, let's discuss about the mechanical and pharmacological interventions. So, if the uterus is atonic, not contracted, we palpate the uh, uterine fundus and rub it, and uh, you can uh, do the bimanual compression as well. And uh, you need to make sure that the bladder is empty, or else you need to put a polycatheter. And uh, you can repeat uh, giving oxytocin, five interventional units, IV slow bolus. Again, uh, if, you give, have, if you have given another five units before, or given a 10 uh, uh, interventional units, IM. And then uh, you can uh, uh, give ergometry, 0.5 milligram by slow IV or intramuscular injection, which is contraindicated with hypertension. And then you need to start on an oxytocin infusion. 40 international units in 500 milliliters of isotonic crystalloids, and then the, the drop rate is about 125 milliliters per hour, unless the fluid restriction is uh, needed. And you can use the carpal post uh, intramuscular injections repeated at intervals not less than 15 minutes to a maximum of eight doses, and misoprostol 18 micrograms sublingually or per rectally. So if the blood loss is exceeding 1,000 milliliters and still continue to bleed after this mechanical as well as the pharmacological management, then we need to go ahead with the uh, surgical intervention. So you need to move the patient to the operating theater. So the first, uh, first line intervention in surgical is uh, the balloon tamponade, uh, yeah, where we uh, put a, a bhakti balloon, the one in the uh, left hand side. Uh, the bacteria balloon into the uterine cavity and which is infiltrated with uh, uh, normal saline up to 400 milliliters and uh, so that will exert some pressure on the uterine wall so you need to start on the, the mother with the continuous uh, 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 oxytocin infusion to make the uterus contracted and uh, so we usually keep this bacteria for about uh, uh, 24 hours and uh, in, the, in this tip, the one, uh, this short tip uh, this uh, this will uh, have the connection with the uh, uterine cavity. So if there's uh, bleeding, these things will come out. So you need to once you put the bacteria, you need to uh, start on the oxytocin infusion, as I told you earlier, and you need to mark on the fundus and uh, you need to monitor these uh, the exit uh, uh, pathway of the bacteria uh, whether uh, she is continuing to have bleeding. So when the bacteria is not available, you can use a condom catheter. Uh, a condom catheter where you use a condom and a 16 gauge foley catheter to make a, a balloon tamponade yeah, within the uterine cavity. In this one, what uh, the, the drawback is, uh, you have no idea if the bleeding is continuous within the uterine cavity because there's no uh, outflow tract. Right. And uh, so we try when we try with the bacteria, and uh, if, uh, if the bleeding is continuous, then second line is uh, the conservative surgical interventions. So uh, the first line is the hemostatic sutures or the compression sutures that we open and put a stitch stitches to the uterus. Uh, this one. So this this is the bleach where we use for. Uh, uh, during cesarean sections, but uh, if it is a normal delivery where you, you don't have a cut in the uterus, you can use a Heyman stitch. There is a two loops going around the uterus, and when you tie them, the uterus becomes squeezed, 
so the world's walls uh, come uh, together each other and the bleeding will be minimized right and uh, if the hemostatic sutures are also not working you can try with the systematic uh, uh, systematic pelvic devascularization de where you ligate the uterine arteries, ovarian arteries, and the uh, internalized egg arteries. So, if the, once you ligate the uterine arteries and the ovary, ovarian artery, if the bleeding settles, then you stop going. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, you won't go and do the internalized egg ligation. The third line is the hysterectomy where you re uh, remove the uterus and you need to do it sooner uh, rather than later. Right. So, uh, traumatic postpartum hemorrhage where you have general tract trauma, valvular vagina, cervical uterine, uh, uh, I mean, tears and the uterine ruptures, episiotomy, you need to uh, do the surgical repair or uh, hysterectomy. And uh, retained uh, products uh, or retained placenta, uh, I mean, uh, if the mother presents with PTH with the retained placenta, you need to do manual removal. And uh, coagulopathy, uh, the DIC, and to it, the embolism. So these type of things you need to manage with the help of the hematological team with the body factors. So after postpartum hemorrhage, you need to debrief the things which happen, and uh, you need to document. I mean, you have to document at the time of doing, and uh, you need to make sure that uh, the documentation is complete, and then you need to assess the risk. Right. My uh, final topic is the second the PPH, where you have abnormal or excessive bleeding from the birth canal uh, up between, I mean, after 24 hours and uh, up to 12 weeks postnatally. Uh, most of the time, this, this is due to infection uh, and uh, so endometritis or endometritis and with uh, retained products of conception. So the, the amount of bleeding, postpartum hemorrhage, uh, is a bit less with the uh, secondary PPH, it's, it's not like the post, I mean, uh, the, uh, it's not like the uh, 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 the bleeding as soon as the delivery, it's less than that, and uh, it's not like an antipartum hemorrhage. So you need to assess, but and if there's any necessity, you need to resuscitate and send the blood for the investigations, full count, CRPs, renal functions, liver functions, cultures, high vagin soaps, low vagin soaps, and uh, blood cultures and ultrasound scan to make sure there are, I mean, to find out whether there are any products within the uterine cavity. And uh, you need to start on broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, we, I mean, if the mother is not severely septic, we start on the simple intravenous antibiotics such as ampicillin or cefiroxine with flagyl. And if the mother is septic, having uh, features of sepsis, then you start on broad spectrum antibiotics with the input uh, of the microbiology team, such as piperacillin uh, tazobacterm uh, or imipenem meropenem with rindamycin. So you need to uh, have a multidisciplinary approach. And then you can manage uh, surgically uh, with the retained products of conception, depending on the amount of uh, retained products and depending on the amount of bleeding. Right, so that's all. Uh, so the, uh, the the lecture is now open for any questions. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Well, see, I'm uh, Dr. Tushar Kurigaman here. Uh, nice so, to hear you from sir. How yeah. are you? <laughs> yeah, fine, fine. Thank you very much. Well, see, uh, now if you open the chat box. Yeah. Uh, as soon as usually um, put their questions uh, in that. Ah, right, right, right. Right. Uh, so there's one question. If mother was found to have primary PPH, 
but uterus well contracted, no retail personal products inside, no perineal tears, all medical management failed. Already three units of blood given. What will be the next management? Right. So, uh, so primary PPH, that means after delivery within 24 hours, the blood uh, and uh, so the causes. So the commonest cause is the uterine atony, but uterus is well contracted, no retained placental products and no perineal tear. So no local causes, no retained placenta and all the medical management is failed. Then we have already given three units of blood. So in this case, if the uterus is contracted, I mean, this is a bit, bit of a, I mean, uh, not a, I mean, a common case scenario which we see, right? And uh, so in this case, what I would suggest is, I would straight away, I mean, uh, uh, there's no place for a buckry in this uh, balloon tamponade in this case, because the uterus is well contracted. So I would go for open and uh, I don't think there's any uh, uh, place for these uh, uh, brace sutures, right? Uh, that Heyman stitch or any uh, any kind of uh, village. So the only thing is the systematic devascularization. So we'll, uh, you can go ahead with the uh, uh, ligation of the uterine artery, ovarian artery, and see whether bleeding uh, reduces. If not, go for the internal iliac arteries ligation and see whether it, it stops. If not, straight away hysterectomy. So that uh, would be the answer for that one. And uh, right. So can we consider advanced maternal age? Yes. And obstetric cholestasis as risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage. Yes. We'll take uh, these two as risk factors in obstetric cholestasis. We start on vitamin K from 36 weeks, um, thinking that it will affect the clotting uh, 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 mechanisms and uh, to prevent uh, obstetric hemorrhages. And uh, the third question. Uh, can we perform instrumental delivery in placental abduction? Yes, that depends. Uh, depends on uh, your vaginal examination findings, right? So sometimes the mother uh, can present with the, uh, uh, the placental abduction at the latter part of uh, the uh, labor. So, right? So if the mother is fully dilated and fulfill all the criteria necessary for a instrumental delivery, you can go ahead. Even placental abruptions, you can go ahead with the vagina delivery. Uh, vagina delivery. That's why I was talking about uh, intrapartum monitoring, right? So, I mean, uh, if it is a minor uh, hemorrhage that is less than 50, which is already settled, or if it is a major, uh, not that much amount without any fetal or maternal compromise, you can deliver and uh, so you can use the instrumentals as well. Right. Anything more? Uh, yes, uh, peri is perineal hematoma due to perineal tear. So sometimes, I mean, uh, we we see these perineal hematomas. Uh, so uh, in perineal hematomas, what happens is you won't be able to see uh, exact uh, bleeding point outside, but the blood uh, collects in between the uh, uh, in, uh, uh, inferior rectal fossa, right? And so the vaginal mucosa will bulge inside. And uh, sometimes there may be a small amount of bleeding outside where the, that, uh, that area is sealed, but the uh, bleeding uh, 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 collects inside. Uh, so they may present with these uh, uh, vaginal hematomas. If it is big, you need to evacuate it. It's difficult, right? Uh, what we basically do is uh, we manage them conservatively. We uh, uh, use this uh, tranexamic acid, uh, the uh, uh, stabilizing agent uh, for the blood clot formation and then we do the vaginal packing and see whether uh, the parameters are changing and see whether the hematoma is getting uh, bigger by an ultrasonically and manage them with, uh, with the cover of antibiotic. Uh, infection in these vaginal hematomas are notorious, very difficult to manage and uh, uh, so we basically manage them conservatively. You can have this type of uh, hematoma, uh, vaginal hematomas, common with this, common with instrumental deliveries and uh, large babies. Uh, right. Okay, I'm getting uh, right. 
Uh, if arterial ligation is done, can she get pregnant again? Yes, you can. Uh, I mean, uh, what does, I mean, the uh, the rationale behind arterial ligation, the uterine arteries, ovaries, internal iliac, is to reduce the pulse pressure. So the pulse pressure is reduced by about 80%. If you ligate the, the uterine arteries, the both ovarian arteries, and the internal iliac arteries. But the collaterals will start. The collaterals will start, uh, uh, I mean, opening, uh, open up, and then the uterine blood flow and the uh, the ovarian blood flow will be maintained, right? Uh, so uh, uh, there won't be much issue with the uh, the pregnancy again. And uh, when it comes to this uh, postpartum hemorrhage, uh, hemorrhage, I mean, uh, you need to save the life, right? <laughs> so uh, in such a case. Uh, uh, we usually go ahead with these uh, ligations and uh, we commonly do it in, you know, primaries or when the mother is having a, uh, one child at home and uh, if the ba this baby is uh, in a critical condition or something like that, we try to conserve the, artery, uh, the, the uterus. But, uh, but if, uh, if, the, uh, uh, if there's any uh, end danger to the life of the mother, you need to take the decision to remove the uterus early. Otherwise, there's no point of, if the mother goes into DIC, and then there's uh, no much effect of removing the uterus. Right, so she, the, the patient can uh, uh, fall in pregnancy again. So is vaginal examination contraindicated in placenta previa? Uh, it's like this, I mean, uh, you can, uh, there's nothing much you can gain to do, I mean, uh, doing a vaginal examination in placenta previa, right? So placenta previa, uh, where the placenta lies on the, uh, on the internal os, right? Uh, so it's contraindicated till you die, I mean, till you uh, uh, to, uh, confirm the, or exclude the placenta previa. And uh, so if it comes in and uh, uh, MCQ, if uh, as vaginal examination is contraindicated in placenta previa, so you uh, you can mark as no, but uh, yeah, you have to be very gentle uh, if you do a vaginal examination. And earlier days, before the ultrasounds are uh, not much developed, uh, uh, then uh, what they have done uh, during uh, I mean, uh, placenta previas, so they do a vaginal examination in the theater. So one day usually does the vaginal examination. And if he can feel the, I mean, you do it when the head is not engaged and uh, uh, and when there's history of antipartum hemorrhages, you do the vaginal examination. And when the, if the placenta is there, the other registra or the senior registra straight away do the cesarean section. So that is how they diagnose the placenta previa in earlier days, where the uh, ultrasounds are not available. And uh, so if it comes in an uh, MCQ, it's a tricky question. You can't say it's contraindicated, but you have to be very cautious. And there's nothing much you can gain from, uh, from uh, a vaginal examination because you can uh, do the uh, assess the length of the cervix. And uh, if the patient is contracting, you can uh, assess the contractions by palpating the, the, the abdomen, right? And then uh, you can diagnose labor. And if there's heavy bleeding with contractions, you straight away go ahead with the cesarean section to deliver. Right. And uh, what is this? So is it 32 weeks or 36 weeks, the cutoff for confirming placenta previa? So the cutoff for confirming placenta previa is 36 weeks. Uh, so what you do is you diagnose it uh, with the anomaly scan, which we usually do around 18 to 20 weeks, right? And uh, then uh, if there's uh, placenta previa or low line placenta, then you uh, do an, I mean, without, if, without any bleeding, you do an ultrasound scan, uh, the screening at 32 weeks. And if still the placenta is, I mean, imaging uh, placenta is low, you do a scan at 36 weeks. So the cut cutoff for confirming placenta previa is 36 weeks without any bleeding. Uh, what is the place for recumbering factors in resuscitation in PPH? Uh, actually, I didn't include that thing. So, uh, factor five, uh, sorry, uh, factor seven, activate factor seven, recombinant factors. Uh, so, they they now advise not to use it. So, you need, I mean, if you use it, you need to get the input from the uh, hematology team. So, and uh, uh, you need to uh, make sure that the, all the other uh, clotting factors are optimized. Uh, 
uh, uh, before giving the re recombinant factors. But when I was a registrar, that was about uh, three, uh, about uh, in 2014-15, recombinant factor, we use it a little bit early, but now uh, we are not using it as a first line or second line. And uh, un when the, uh, the bleeding is not settling with uh, the optimization of the, all the other protein factors and the platelet count more than 50, then only you can use but this should uh, get the input from the transfusion medicine consultant as well as the hematology team input. Right. Why does DIC occur in amniotic fluid embolism? So what happens when the, uh, the fetal, uh, the cells and uh, these, uh, the amniotic fluid goes into it, uh, uh, makes an uh, immune reaction. And uh, so that will, uh, uh, start on the, uh, the clotting uh, mechanisms uh, in the uh, uh, in the, uh, the the matter in the mother, so that will uh, that will result in and uh, consumptive coagulopathy and ended up in DIC. What is external capital equation? <laughs> right. Uh, so this is uh, out of my topic, but the external capital equation is uh, where you turn the baby. We we do it for breach. Uh, breach when uh, with malpresentations and uh, so in uh, uh, primates we do it uh, around uh, 37 weeks and uh, in multis we do it around 36 weeks and uh, you need to uh, I mean uh, there should be I mean you need to assess whether the mother is uh, uh, okay compatible with the vaginal birth and uh, uh, there shouldn't be any risk factors for external cephalic equation. And then you need to uh, find out where the placenta location, anterior placenta be difficult to, and we don't usually do. And uh, dribbling, we don't do, we should do. And preeclampsia, we don't do the ECVs. And uh, where you turn the baby to the head, uh, the other cephalic, uh, which has less uh, risk in uh, vaginal deliveries when it compared to uh, the breech deliveries. Right, okay. Is there any place for recombinant factor seven? As I told you early, uh, in severe PPHS, when the, all the clotting factors are optimized, you can use it with the input from the hematology and the transfusion medicine consultant. If a mother is still complains of pain after episiotomy suturing, even after coming, confirming no retained products of conception, how should be our approach to assess her for any risks? If a mother still complains of pain after episiotomy suture, even after confirming no retained products, bit of a confused, confused question. Uh, it's like, I mean, there are so many causes for the pain, I mean, after delivery, right? So, uh, it's pain, right? So, I mean, so episiotomy can cause severe pain, right? And uh, sometimes uh, even the urinary retention can cause pain. So you need to find out whether, I mean, these causes are addressed, right? Retained products, uh, sometimes, I mean, usually they don't cause any much, much pain, right? Uh, so they, they present with this postpartum hemorrhages and sometimes infections causing endometritis, endometritis. And uh, so I will uh, go out of that question for a while. Right, so how, how reliable is antenatal transvaginal ultrasound scan when it comes to diagnosing mass of previa? Well, actually, uh, it's, uh, there's no, I mean, uh, that's what I was uh, uh, talking about. Uh, the, uh, uh, they don't suggest to do the universal screening uh, at the morphology scan uh, for uh, the VASA previa. Uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, you can diagnose you can diagnose. I have seen that these diagnoses, um, which were given by the radiologist. Uh, I mean, when we have a doubt, sometimes we get their input and then they locate these uh, placentas. And it is commonly, I mean, uh, it's very reliable uh, with these uh, placentas with accessory lobe or the succentuate lobes with, uh, with uh, the connections, uh, the vascular connections. And uh, I can't, uh, uh, sorry, I'm not aware of, I don't have the details of the exact uh, percentage, but if you go through the the uh, uh, RCOG guideline, you will definitely find the percentage. I can't remember the exact percentage of the 
the, uh, the, the sensitivity, sensitivity of the uh, transfer channel scan in diagnosing mass of reading. Can we do previous in diagnosing uh, placenta previa? Yes, we can do the transfer channel scan in diagnosing placenta previa. And uh, so you need to be very gentle on uh, doing it. So in managing PPH is elective embolization practice. Well, it's not available in our country, but uh, uh, it is available in, uh, in developed countries with uh, all the facilities. What they do is they, they, uh, they go through this uh, uh, internal, uh, sorry, uh, external iliac vein, and then uh, they insert some balloons uh, onto these uh, uh, uterine arteries. And uh, so they, they do it uh, with these, uh, uh, with the uh, placenta previa cases, major to placenta previa with morbid adherence, placenta uh, percreta mainly. And uh, once, as soon as we deliver the baby, so they inflate these balloons and then that uh, uh, occludes the, the uterine arteries, and but not very common, commonly used. And uh, uh, I, I, I did my overseas training in Australia and I went to a couple of uh, couple of their sessions and then they were talking about this but they said that it's uh, it's not practiced anymore there because you have other options right uh, can you briefly explain about the manual removal of placenta yes uh, right so uh, what uh, when the mother delivers uh, uh, the baby and uh, if the placenta is not uh, not delivered by about 30 minutes or if there's heavy bleeding uh, uh, before 30 minutes, then you uh, do the manual removal. Uh, so uh, the, there are a few components which is mandatory in manual removal. Uh, first thing is uh, you need to uh, uh, do it under sterile conditions. And then the second thing is uh, the mother should be sedated adequately. So in our setup, we usually give bethidine. In other, other countries, they give a spinal, right? And uh, then uh, the third thing is the, the person who is doing the manual removal should be, I mean, experienced, right? So you go along the uh, the cord. Uh, I mean, you need to have a, I mean, there are special blouses, but uh, not in our country where it covers up to your elbow, right? So you give the, uh, uh, you keep the mother in the lithotomy position, and then you sedate the mother with petidine, and uh, which is given in our setup, right? And then you empty the bladder, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> You empty the bladder and you go along the cord and then try to find the placental edge. So from your non-dominant hand, that is from your left hand, you need to palpate the fundus and stabilize the uterus. And uh, so that gives an idea uh, about the size of the uterus and then where you, and uh, then that prevents uh, damage in the, the myometrium or the uterine wall. And uh, so you go and find the edge of the placenta and then you scoop it. You don't dig, you, you scoop it from your finger. Uh, from the uh, side of the fingers and then take out the placenta. So uh, so you have to, I mean, you need to have some sort of experience on doing this and uh, you don't, you know, take out the pieces. So you try to take the whole placenta out and uh, you check for the quartilitons afterwards. And if there are further remaining, you do it again. Right. So is bleeding due to placenta previa is painless in all cases. So most of the time placenta, the bleeding from the placenta previa is painless, right? Unless there are some, uh, some form of uh, hematoma or uh, formation. Uh, so most of the time it's painless. So uh, abruptions, they're painful. Sometimes local causes are painful as well, such as postcoital trauma, right? Can we misdiagnose was a previous present of previous in early pregnancy? Uh, well, uh, I mean, what we do in uh, diagnosing of was previa is we usually use the Doppler, right? So uh, these uh, was previous are usually associated with low lying placenta. So if the placenta comes and covers the internal loss, we call it placenta previa. And the low lying placenta is where the placentas are low with elementous cord insertions, you can, uh, you can. Uh, you diagnose the vasa previa. So you use the Doppler. In Doppler, I mean, it, it shows the blood flow. So in uh, the, the placenta is a mass, boogie mass. So it clearly differentiate the, the vasa previa uh, the, and the uh, placental mass where you uh, can, but there's some sort of, I mean, 
uh, I mean, there can be some sort of diagnosis, but very less chance is very less. How often do we cure uh, 500 international units of entity immunoglobulin if the maternal hemorrhage is more than four mil after 20 weeks of period of gestation? Uh, how often do we cure 500 international units of entity immunoglobulin if we do? Right, it's like, I mean, in our setup, the entity, the rogam wire contains 1,500 international units, right? So after 20 weeks, you need to give 500 international units and uh, for prophylaxis, right? For the prophylaxis, we, we used to give uh, 500 at 28 and 34, or else, I mean, in our setup, we give 1,500 uh, straight away. And if there's recurrent uh, uh, antipartum hemorrhages, so you need to give it six weekly. Six weekly, we had to give it six weekly. You can, uh, yes. Uh, you can use the selective embolization, which is uh, uh, using less commonly, not a common practice, not uh, not enough. Can you briefly? Uh, So how often do we give 500 international, right? If a mother presents with morbidity adherent placenta, uh, if a mother presents with morbidity adherent placenta and the plane of cleavage is not clear, if the mother is expecting to get pregnant again, a denying hysterectomy should we leave the placenta inside? If so, won't that cause continuation of uh, Continuation bleeding, causing uterine hydro. Yes, uh, this is one of the methods which we used to do, right? Uh, uh, when when you want to conserve the the uterus, what we basically do is we do upper segment cesarean section, and uh, we uh, deliver the baby from the top. You put a midline incision. Sometimes you can do it from a final seal, and then you uh, do a upper uh, uterine segment incision. Take the baby out, clamp the cord and you don't use any oxytox uh, uterotonics and uh, the, the mother is not allowed to breastfeed and then you tie the cord with a, uh, with a, uh, a white cream and then you shoot the uterus and you keep the, the, the placenta and come out. So, uh, I mean, uh, now it's not commonly practiced because of uh, its complications. So after doing this, uh, you need to uh, keep the mother in hospital uh, till the, the placental mass uh, uh, getting less and less and uh, in size and uh, you need to always get ready for an emergency uh, uh, surgery uh, if the mother uh, presents with uh, uh, bleeding again. But I have seen some successful cases and it can practice as well. Do we have to give corticosteroids for all the deliveries happening before 39 weeks? If not, what is the limit? Uh, not all the deliveries, all the cesarean section before 39 weeks, we have to give uh, steroids, corticosteroids. And uh, for normally grown babies up to 30, uh, uh, 34 weeks, you have to give it steroids. And if the mother is uh, having a, a growth restricted baby, uh, 35 plus 6. Uh, up to 35 plus 6 will uh, give steroids. So uh, uh, if, if the mother is planning for a normal vaginal delivery, you don't need to give up to 39 weeks. But cesarean sections less than 39 weeks, the RCOG guideline says you need to give steroids. Uh, for uh, babies, for mothers with fetal growth restricted babies, up to 35 plus 6 and others up to 34 plus 6. Uh, if a mother after cesarean section develops PPH, is bleeding suturing directly is better than going for buccal catheter before that? Well, uh, that depends on the course, right? Uh, you can use the buccal as well. You can use the buccal, but I prefer for a bleeding straight away. Where you, uh, I mean, uh, you, where you have the options of, I mean, you put the bleeding and uh, uh, see. Uh, uh, that dip, uh, see whether the bleeding is settles and uh, the answer depends on the the uh, 
uh, consultants or the, uh, the operator's preference. And uh, so the way around, so the, 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 uh, the, the site where we attach the urinary catheter or the site where we, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, yes Ponsiri. Yeah. All right, right, sir. Uh, so the buckry catheter is inserted in the other way around uh, during cesarean sections. Uh, so and uh, you can use the same way, but usually I, uh, I mean myself, I prefer for a bilinch or a Heyman stitch or modify bilinch uh, when it uh, comes to a, a buckry catheter. But you can try. You can uh, do it. Please give a small account on supra and infra levator hematomas. Right. So uh, this type of uh, hematomas can occur with the, mainly with the instrumental delivery, especially with the, the forceps. The supra levator hematomas occur with the rotational forceps, key length forceps, and uh, so uh, and the infralivator uh, hematomas also can occur with these instrumental assisted deliveries or when there's large babies, especially with the diabetics. So they they won't, I mean, uh, they, the important thing is, it. I mean, they won't come up with bleeding. So the mother can go into shock. The mother can present with tachycardia and evidence of clinically pallor with low blood pressure and all the stuff with minimal bleeding. So the hematomas are occurring inside. And most of the time we manage them conservatively, but if the, uh, the, uh, the hematomas are expanding uh, and uh, causing hemodynamic instability in the, uh, the mother, then we need to go and operate. And uh, what we basically do is we go for internal iliac ligation and try to equate and packing and then come out and then second look surgery. Right. Uh, do we have to take the consent of the husband in emergency hysterectomy? So, I mean, uh, in placenta previous and abruptions and all the cases, uh, we usually take the consent from the mother. And even without the consent, you can go ahead with the hysterectomy in terms of saving the life of the, the patient. So you don't need to take the consent from the husband uh, in terms of hysterectomy. But what we usually do is in placenta previous, we usually, I mean, discuss with, uh, with the, uh, the mother as well as the husband or the partner. And we explain and then uh, tell these, uh, these things uh, uh can occur and sometimes you may end up with an hysterectomy and we get the consent when they comes but uh, you don't need to get the consent from the, the husband or the partner uh, will there be any defects on the placenta if the mother has undiagnosed placenta accreta will there be any defects on placenta so that means, uh, I mean, uh, what I understand from this question is uh, once the placenta is delivered, whether there are any missing cotton So there can be, there can be, uh, I mean, these things can occur sometimes. Uh, for an example, I, I recently got a case where uh, the mother has undergone uh, uh, ERTC, evacuation of retained products of conception, and then there might have been some sort of uh, some sort of uh, perforation, which was not uh, diagnosed at the time of the ERTC. And then she, she was pregnant and delivered recently in my unit. And uh, she, uh, her placenta was, uh, uh, it was retained and uh, we uh, removed the placenta with some, and uh, there were some missing cotyledons. And uh, since there was some bleeding, I had to uh, go, uh, go for a, I mean, uh, uh, ERTC, uh, uh, I mean, uh, she has undergone uh, general, uh, we, we put her onto, uh, uh, onto general anesthesia and uh, then try to do a ERPC, which I, uh, we, uh, when I noticed that uh, there are some part of the cotyledons was tightly adhered to the upper part of the uterus, then uh, uh, we opened and uh, we removed that part because there was continuous bleeding and there was some bleeding uh, in the abdomen last fill. So there can be some sort of uh, missing uh, cotyledons in uh, undiagnosed accretas in such kind of, I mean, perforations or something like that. 
is drainage of uh, hematoma and figure of its suture just for the infralevator hematoma or can it be done even in supralevator hematomas? Uh, well, uh, you can do it for the infralevator, but uh, not with the supralevator hematomas. We try to actually base, we try to manage them conservatively. Uh, that becomes hemodynamically unstable. Yeah, the questions. Yeah. If there are questions, right. uh, you should be able to see. All right. Under the chat. Chat me no. I think uh, so that's all. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and uh, all for your exams. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you, Punsiri, for taking time and, uh, you know, giving the lecture to students. So, hope you're enjoying Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, far away from the place, uh, from my native place, but enjoy. A lot of uh -huh. delivery, a lot of bad multis. I have never seen the P P11s. <laughs> <laughs> my yeah, area, which I <laughs> see, which is very common here. So this this area is uh, almost ninety nine percent Muslim area, sir. and uh, okay. I think uh, this is the highly fertile area in Sri Lanka. I have okay. all sort of complications. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, 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 can I add one more thing? Uh, yes, ma one is going to ask uh, regarding uh, performing transvaginal scan. Uh, in a uh, APH or in yes. placenta previa. Placenta previa, yeah. yeah. Another question that they will be questioning, another... Uh, uh, the another vaginal question. examination. Yeah, the uh, patient the can, uh, we can do the speculum examination yeah. in a scenario like that, but not digital examination or examination with fingers. So, yeah. it's yeah. again uh, checked in the exam. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Just... Yeah. Uh, uh, can you give something on this? Uh, I mean, uh, I think I couldn't answer the properly with this uh, uh, supra elevator hematomas uh, for the for the question. Yeah, so yeah, have... uh, uh, yeah. I was hearing the question. Uh, I don't think mm. it is not for undergraduates. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not undergraduates for definitely. Uh, what they should know is uh, there can be concealed bleeding. Uh, bleeding where the patient is hemodynamically uh, unstable, unstable. disproportionate to the vaginal blood loss. Yeah. There is a discrepancy between the, uh, the hemodynamic instability versus the blood loss vagina. So in that case, we have to suspect intra-abdominal bleeding. So one thing, as you clearly highlighted, clearly explained, uh, uh, rotational forceps or mid-cavity forceps, it's a risk factor for this thing and uh, that's what they should know. They don't need to know the... Uh, no need to know the stuff. Yes. Sorry. Right. Okay. Thanks, Gyan. Okay, Bunsri. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for your participation, all the participants. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.